I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my, my name is Steve Sroka, and I am Associate Director of Events for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. I've been with the Foundation for 12 years and absolutely love the organization that I work for and love what I do for, for my career. And uh, it's great to see all of you out here. I see a lot of familiar faces. We have a great session here, and I'd like to start out by introducing the speakers for today. We're gonna to start out by having a 15 minute session with each of the doctors or each of the present presenters, and then we'll have a 15 minute question and answer period uh, following that. So uh, please refrain from questions, but the, the speakers will be available afterward. And as you know, they've been available throughout this entire conference. So first off, I'd like to introduce uh, Erica Davis is a human genetic researcher at the Duke University Medical Center. Although she has a primary academic appointment as an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Neontology, and a secondary appointment in the Department of Cell Biology, her intellectual home is Duke University Center for Human Disease Modeling. Dr. Davis's research interests include rare pediatric disorders, such as the ciliopathies, and she has worked on the retinal ciliopathy, Bardet Beetle syndrome for more than 10 years. Our second speaker is Dr. Z uh, is Kelsey Zegar is a genetic counselor with the Ocular Disease Program at Informed DNA. She received her MS in genetic counseling from the University of Colorado Denver in 2012 and earned her board certification that same year. Prior to her current position, Dr. Z Mr. Mrs. Zegar held the faculty position of instructor with the University of Colorado School of Medicine and counseled patients in the genetics, genetics cl clinics at Children's Hospital Colorado. She played an integral role in expanding the ocular, de de ocular genetic specialty clinics to serve pediatric and adult patients with inherited retinal diseases and development eye or disorders. Mr. Zegar, Ms. Ms. Zegar, apologies, <laughs> uh, joined Informed DNA last fall and currently provides telephone genetic counseling to patients with inherited retinal diseases and other rare genetic disorders. She is also active with the Foundation Fighting Blindness Denver chapter she is passionate about sharing her genetics expertise with patients, families, and other medical providers, and helping to navigate the complex world of genetic testing. Uh, the third speaker is gonna be Brian Mansfield. Uh, Brian is the Senior uh, Vice President of Research for the Foundation Fighting Blindness, um, with background in biochemistry and genetics. He came to FFB from a startup company, uh, which uh, we'll go into detail as they speak. So please, at first now, welcome uh, Erica Davis. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I am actually one of those people who raised my hands earlier today because this is my first FFB meeting as well. And it is it's such a, a pleasure to be here to kick off this session about genetics, genetic testing, and genetic registries. And as you heard in Steve's introduction, I am a human genetics researcher. And what really gets me excited to get out of bed every day and to go to the lab to work is the possibility that I might discover something new. And I might discover something new that could provide information to the patient community to try to help inform and develop novel therapeutics. So at the foundation of this, however, is the need to understand genetics. So this is really, really crucial to enable understanding of the, the underlying disease mechanisms in the retina and to help and to eventually tailor these therapeutics that we hope can be developed for each and every individual um, dependent upon their genetic makeup. So I'm going to begin with a basic overview of genetics. And this is really something that you've probably heard of. Genetics, it's important. You might have heard about it in school. But I just want to kind of redefine it as the study of how traits, such as hair color, maybe how tall you are, or your susceptibility for um, a particular disease, might be passed from one generation to the next, or from parent to child. And so this field of genetics is actually not new. So if we go back to the mid 1800s, there was this Austrian monk and his name was Gregor Mendel. You might have heard of him. He had a fabulous garden from what I understand. And he was interested in studying plants and, and based on his work, studying the way that his pea plants might have been wrinkled 
or might have been smooth. He, he really helped to set a foundation for geneticists and, and the principles of heredity. So certainly plants and genetics has been really important. We've applied genetics to animals as well. So I'm going to bring you just a little bit further in time to the Columbia fly room in the early 1900s, where Thomas Hunt Morgan used the fruit fly to study eye color and transmission of genes on chromosomes. So these are something that are really important when we think about genetics. So what about humans? Humans and health and disease. So this is not something, something new that we've, we've been thinking about recently. Actually, there are, are doctors and researchers who have been observing how particular traits or diseases have been passed through families for years and years. And the example I'm going to give you from 100 years ago is, is the, the disorder that we focus on in our lab. This is Barty Beetle syndrome. And so this, these are named for the French and the Hungarian physicians who first observed that there were sisters in this family who had this peculiar retinal degeneration and obesity syndrome. So genetics has been around for, our, for a while. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the basics. So who are the important players in, in genetics when we think about transmission of traits from one, genetic, run, one gen generation to, to the next? So let's, let's, let's start with a human. So we're all made up of different organs in our body, right? So we all have a heart, kidney, liver. Of course, we have eyes. In, the, in, the, in our eyes, we have the retina. And so each of those organs are made up of cells. The cells each have a nucleus. If you want to think about the nucleus, it's the command center of the cell. And that command center is where all the, the fun genetic stuff happens. So there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in each nucleus. And, and each of those pairs, we inherited one half from our mom and one half from our dad. So this is really important to keep in mind. And those chromosomes, they're made up of DNA. It's tightly packed up DNA. And, and those are made up of this, this special alphabet of four letters. So there's A, C, T, and G. This is a four-letter alphabet that makes up a very important code. That is the instructions. So this is the instructions how to, of how to make proteins and how to essentially build and maintain a human and all of the different parts of the human body. So we all have 3.2 billion letters that make up the DNA in our genomes. So this is, is a, a huge number. And if you want to think about this complete set of instructions, it's a big space big space of letters where, where we can perhaps have some, some variants, some DNA variants that you might have heard about. So 3.2 billion letters. Let me come back to that, how, how many that is. So, so that's a lot. So if you, if you want to take home some trivia to impress your friends going home from this meeting, if we were to recite all of the letters in the genome and you, you said one letter per second and you didn't stop, you didn't stop to take a break to sleep to do anything. Any idea how long it would take? It would take a, a really long time. So it would take 100 years. 100 years. Please don't try this at home, OK? So there's a lot of space in the human genome. And we often focus on the regions of the genome that code for genes. And that's actually only 2% of the genome that's coding for proteins. And this is the part that, that makes up the cells. And so there are approximately 25,000 genes in the human genome, and we call this the exome because it has exons in the genes. And we know that there are about 300 genes that are important to develop and to maintain an eye and a retina. So these are um, really important for maintaining this health. Now, when we think about the, the genome and all of these letters, you might be wondering, so is everybody in the room the same? So the answer is no, unless you're here with your identical twin. OK, so we all have differences in our DNA. And, and these differences, many of them, are just differences that might make us look different. OK, so it might make, make you look different from me or the person who you're not related to who's sitting next to you. And so many of these variants are harmless. We call them benign. And, and if you want to think about this in terms of spelling of a word, spelling of the word gray, for example, you could spell it G-R-A-Y. 
but you could also spell it G-R-E-Y. And there's a variant in there, but it, it still has the same meaning. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's not doing anything damaging. So it's a, it's a variant. It's a DNA change. But there are a few variants that, that might give way to a different meaning in the instructions to build proteins and cause a cell to not work in the way that it's supposed to, resulting in some sort of a medical condition, okay? So another way to think of genetic variation, you might want to think about it as a house. You think about a blueprint for a house. Um, this might be houses in your neighborhood, your dream neighborhood, your, your parents' neighborhood. And each house is a little bit different. Some might be a little bit larger, some might be a little bit smaller, some are made of brick, some are made of stone. But each house still serves the same purpose, right? It's a place that you call home. It's a place where you live. It has the number of rooms that you would expect, the kitchen, bathrooms, all of these things. But if you want to go back to that blueprint and there's a major mistake that might cause the foundation to be uneven. Now, this is a different type of variation that could cause something detrimental in your house, such that it might come crumbling down to the ground um, much sooner than, than you think that it should. So this is a different type of variation that can give rise to, to, to disease. Okay, so we talk about variants. We have some that are benign, some that are actually doing something bad. So how are, where do variants come from and how are they passed from one generation to the next? So we all have variants, um, but they might arise de novo. So they might be new. And, and these often happen when cells are dividing and the DNA has to copy itself, and sometimes it makes mistakes that are not fixed. So this is a de novo variant, but many of the other variants are inherited from our parents. And so you might have heard of these different inheritance patterns. So three, three common ones. First of all, there's autosomal dominant, when uh, there's one copy of a gene that is sufficient to give rise to, to a, a disease or a medical condition. And this is where a parent has a 50% chance of transmitting this to uh, his or her child. And so another type of inheritance mechanism is autosomal recessive. So this is where if you have two parents who are carriers of mutations that are damaging to the gene, they have a 25% chance of passing that on to their child. And then there's another type of inheritance pattern that might be specific to boys or girls, and this has to do with the sex chromosomes. So you might have heard about how we need an X and a Y chromosome um, for males, and females have two X chromosomes. That makes us different. And so if there is a mutation, a damaging mutation on the X chromosome that the mom has, she has a 50% chance of passing that on to a son who could be affected with some sort of disorder, or a 50% chance that her daughter will be a carrier just like her. So certainly some visual conditions such as, as retinitis pigmentosa can follow any one of these three inheritance patterns, but there are others that are fairly strict in the inheritance pattern that they have. So Barney Beetle syndrome that I study, Usher syndrome and Stargardt, these are all examples of autosomal recessive inheritance patterns. So why are these important? Why am I spending time on these? So these are important to help parents, to help family members understand the risk of recurrence. So how, what is the likelihood that this could happen again? How often could another visual condition happen in a person in that family? So it's important to know that. Okay, so the next question is, is how do we identify a gene variant? So we talked about the genome, we talked about some variants that are benign, some can give rise to blindness, for example. Well, we've come a long way in the way that we can study and, and look at the information that the genome is, is carrying. And so this is a really exciting time in human genetics because we have all this great technology to be able to read all of the letters in the human genome. And so when we're looking for that single letter change that could be giving rise to a blindness condition, it can seem like looking for a needle in a haystack. So this is a really daunting task, but we have the technology now to be able to do that. So before we can perform any genetic testing, we need a DNA sample. So anybody who's done genetic testing will know that you probably gave a blood sample or a saliva sample, and this is where that sample would come back to a laboratory, such as ours, and there's a person or a machine 
and they'll go through a series of steps and will, at the very end, have a tube of liquid that has no color. Okay, so if you've ever watched any documentaries about labs on TV, they're always pipetting blue liquid. It's not true. It has no color. No color in the tubes, okay? So this is what DNA looks like. It's, it's got a lot of information, but it's not very exciting to look at. And so once we have our DNA, uh, we, can, we can apply some technologies to read those letters. So one example of that is if we, if we know about a gene, if we have a family member perhaps with a mutation in a gene, say RPE65, we can go in and, and sequence that in a different person from the family in a very targeted way. But if we don't know, what do we do? So we actually have efficient methods where we can sequence several genes at one time. And so we call this a panel test, and you may have heard of that already. And so, for example, in Bardet Beetle syndrome, there are over 20 different genes that can cause this disorder. So if we were to sequence one gene at a time, this would not be a very efficient or cost-effective way. And of course, the family would be waiting forever for some sort of information. So we can actually do it all at one time. So sometimes a panel test might be inconclusive. We don't always get an answer. And this is something really important to keep in mind. So this can be frustrating. It's frustrating for me. I'm sure it's frustrating for, for the folks who are having that genetic testing done. Uh, but it actually offers an opportunity for further research and, and possibly a new discovery. So we can move to other broader sequencing methods from that panel test to something looking at all 25,000 genes of the genome or even the entire 3.2 billion letters of the genome. So we have the ability to do that in the research laboratory. And certainly, we need to go through several steps in, in analyzing because it's a lot of data. And, and we're always looking for DNA changes that are rare in the general population. They're predicted to be important to protein function, to, to cause something bad to happen to that protein. They're typically inherited from parents, or they've occurred new in, in the individual who we're studying. It makes possible biological sense, and, and we always look to see if the gene that has a DNA variant or a mutation is also present in, in individuals with a similar set of, of clinical features. So before I turn the session over to our next speaker, I just want to recap the five, five big points that I've made with you. So, so point number one is you walk away and you think, okay, what did I learn about that in that genetics session? So first of all, genetics, what is it? It's the study of transmission of traits within families. So it's kind of the foundation of, of everything we're doing toward therapeutic discovery. Uh, the genome is big. It's a vast place, 3.2 billion letters of DNA. Remember, 100 years to recite all of that. And it's packaged in chromosomes. And so we all have genetic variants. And, and some of us just, just make us look different from one another, where as some of them are actually the ones that can have a, a negative impact on our health. And there are multiple inheritance patterns that are important to be aware of. So some examples, dominant, recessive, and X-linked. And finally, we can identify these variants by employing this vast suite of technologies to actually read all the letters of the genome and compare them to the reference human genome to try to learn maybe what is the underlying cause of a blindness disorder. So at this point, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the trust that you put into researchers like me by participating in genetic studies. And I look forward to your questions after the next two speakers. Thank you, Erica. And before I move on uh, to the next speaker, uh, a lot of you have just, just joined us and we have a full house here. Just a reminder that this is being live streamed on Facebook uh, and on I on the Bly, uh, uh, sorry, I on the Bly, let's spit that out. I on the Cure blog, sorry. Um, also, if you are on Twitter and Facebook, please share the links that we have out there. We wanna make sure that this goes out to as broad of an audience as possible. We have some amazing speakers that are here today and then throughout the conference. And I know we repeat this over and over, but it's really imperative that we get the word out about what these doctors are doing right now. Um, there's people that could not attend this meeting across the country and throughout the world. And the more people that reach this, 
uh, the more people that are going to get involved with the foundation. So we really appreciate you uh, reaching out to them and sharing those links to, uh, to the world. Um, and now I'd like to welcome, um, as I introduced earlier, uh, uh, Kelsey Zegar from, uh, from Informed DNA, uh, and she'll be our next speaker. As, as well, I'd like to also mention that after the speakers are done, since we, so some of you came in a little later, we'll have a 15 minute question and answer period at the end, so please hold on your questions, we'll have mic runners coming around. So now, for now, please welcome Kelsey Zegar. Thank you so much for that kind introduction again, and uh, thank you all for having me at this conference. This is my first time attending a Visions conference as well, um, so I've enjoyed uh, learning a lot so far, and um, hopefully I can add to that a little bit today. Um, so to build on what uh, Dr. Davis just spoke about, um, kind of uh, genetics concepts, um, I want to apply that a little bit more to retinal uh, degeneration specifically. So if you're sitting in the audience um, with a diagnosis of a retinal disorder or if you have a family member who's been diagnosed, you may be wondering, well, if I already have this diagnosis, why even do genetic testing? What information could that add uh, for me? Um, so uh, there are several different reasons why a person might consider genetic testing um, and different people, you know, different reasons resonate with different people. Uh, so one reason could be to help sort out the inheritance pattern that applies to your specific diagnosis. Um, so as Dr. Davis touched on, there are multiple different inheritance patterns that apply to different retinal diagnoses. Um, and particularly if you're the first and only person in your family to be diagnosed with your disorder, um, we don't have a lot of family history information there to go on to say, what kind of pattern does this follow? Where did this come from? Is it from both sides of the family, one side of the family, or did it happen brand new in you? Um, and so if we can identify the specific gene that caused your condition in the first place, that helps us figure out, um, does your condition follow a dominant inheritance pattern, a recessive pattern, or an X-linked pattern? Uh, a genetic test result can also help us um, and your doctors clarify your diagnosis. Um, so many of you may be sitting in the audience with a very clear clinical diagnosis based on all the testing that you've had done. Um, but for some individuals out there, the diagnosis remains a bit unclear. Um, so we recognize there's some sort of retinal degeneration and vision loss present, but we're not totally sure what to call it or what caused it in the first place or what to expect going forward. Um, so sometimes if we're able to learn which gene caused the problem in the first place, um, it can help us understand the, you know, a more accurate name for that condition or what to expect going forward. Um, specifically for young individuals, um, clarifying that diagnosis can help us sort out, um, is this a non-syndromic uh, retinal disorder, meaning that it only affects the eyes and vision, or is it a condition that occurs as part of a larger genetic syndrome, meaning that a person could have retinal disease in addition to other developmental or medical concerns like hearing loss um, or kidney disease, for example. Um, and so that type of information can be really useful, again, in young patients to help us uh, come up with a really appropriate medical uh, management plan for them. Um, and now more than ever, um, people are interested in genetic testing, especially for retinal disorders, to help them understand, um, do they have the type of condition that would qualify for a treatment or a clinical trial, either now or a trial that might be available in the future? Um, because specifically when it comes to gene therapy, we have to understand which gene caused the problem in the first place in order to understand how to treat it and how to target that gene uh, through treatment. So um, if we're not targeting the right problem, we won't get a good result. So we want to understand the process um, from the cause all the way through treatment. Um, so in order to figure out which gene causes the problem, we have to do genetic testing because it's really hard to just look in someone's eyes and decide which gene caused that problem uh, because there's so many genetic possibilities um, and all of the symptoms look very similar from person to person. Um, so in the world of retinal diseases, uh, we know of well over 200, almost 300 different genes at this point that can cause retinitis pigmentosa, cone rod dystrophy, Stargardt, I mean the whole, uh, the whole gamut. And so it can be really difficult to tell just by looking in someone's eyes. Um, and for that reason, you know, diagnoses like retinitis pigmentosa, we really don't consider one specific diagnosis. It's not one disease. Um, it's very dependent and it can vary a lot from person to person depending on which gene caused that problem in the first place. 
Um, so because it's difficult to tell by clinical symptoms which gene is the problem, we find it really useful to test multiple genes all at the same time. Um, that wasn't available to us uh, from a technology perspective until uh, just a few years ago. Um, in the beginning, we had to test one or a handful of genes at a time. But now we are able to analyze that full group of genes, uh, well over 200 different genes now. We can test them all at the same time to help us figure out which gene has a mutation in it or an abnormality that prevents that gene from working in the retina. Um, so in many ways, if you have um, a, a pretty clear clinical diagnosis, sometimes you can select a list of genes to test that are very specific to that diagnosis. Um, like if you have Stargardt, for example, we can test a rather limited number of genes. Um, or we can just go for the whole big group, over 200 genes all at the same time, just to make sure we're not missing anything, uh, to see what we find. Um, and more and more, that's becoming the, mo the most cost-effective option. There's not a huge cost difference between testing a small group of genes versus a large group. Um, so more and more, we're able to, to jump to that large group of genes. Um, there's also some differences in genetic testing based on um, who you go to to order the test. So um, many individuals have had uh, research genetic testing in the past where they participated in a research study. Um, and if you ever participated in that, you may know, um, you may have never received your results or it took a long time to get those results back. Um, but now more and more we're able to order testing through clinical labs, uh, meaning that we're able to um, pay a lab essentially and that gives them a reason to turn around the test a lot quicker. So most of our genetic testing that we send out now on a clinical basis, we can get results back in one to two months, uh, which is a huge improvement over a six month time frame or years or more that it was in the past. Um, so if you go through that genetic testing process, uh, the ultimate goal is to get your results back, figure out which gene uh, caused your condition in the first place. Um, but we have learned, um, including myself, that uh, this is not as black and white um, as we thought or had hoped. So um, it's really important to involve a genetic specialist of some kind to help you interpret those test results because um, you know, the, the lab report that's issued is not always the most easy document to understand. Um, and so in my role as a genetic counselor, my primary role is to help patients understand their test results, um, kind of make sense you know, what does that mean for their diagnosis? What does that mean for their prognosis and their vision going forward? Um, and what does that mean for their family? You know, what inheritance pattern does that follow? Who else in the family should we be thinking about um, when it comes to additional genetic testing or um, even a clinical evaluation? Um, because most of the time these results are very complex. It would be really nice if every result that came back um, just gave us a nice, clear one-sentence answer at the top, but if you've ever seen a genetic test results report, um, that's almost never the case. Um, and so, as a genetic counselor, I really try to be part of a healthcare team um, to help interpret those genetic test results. Um, and I think that that, um, you know, can be really useful to the providers that you work with. They don't have to turn into genetic specialists overnight. I think they really appreciate that aspect of it. Um, and we're, we're essentially there to try to help you understand your individual results. Um, so these test results, when they come back, um, I think one really important thing to understand if you're considering genetic testing, even before you start the whole process, is to understand for this group of retinal degenerative disorders, we don't find a positive result in everyone that goes through genetic testing. Um, it's absolutely not a guarantee. But at this point, with the well over 200 different genes that we're able to test, we expect to find an answer about 60 or 70% of the time across the board. Um, so, you know, if you fall in that group, it's a really helpful piece of the puzzle um, to add to your diagnosis to understand which gene caused your condition in the first place. Um, but if you are one of those individuals that come back with an inconclusive result or a negative result, you're absolutely not alone in that. Um, you know, 30 to 40% of the people who go through genetic testing don't get a clearly positive result. Um, so one of the biggest kind of bugaboos that we have in the world of genetic testing is this result called a variant of uncertain significance. I don't know if anyone has had the pleasure <laughs> of talking about that or getting that back on their test result, but a variant of uncertain significance is like a gray zone result for us. Um, it's a result where we know there's something different about that DNA sequence compared to most people's DNA, 
but we don't have enough information about that variant to understand, is it truly severe enough to lead to a retinal disease or a medical problem? Or is it just one of those variants that makes one person different from the next person, makes my DNA different than your DNA, without actually causing a problem? Um, so it's really important to point out that just because we find a result or find a variant on genetic testing, it's not automatically a problem and it's not automatically the answer. And so we as genetic counselors and other genetic specialists, um, you know, try to help work through that and understand those variants. Um, if we do get a variant of uncertain significance, there are ways that we can try to learn more about that. So the labs that are doing this genetic testing are learning more and more about these variants, um, and if they detect those same variants in other individuals with the same diagnosis, that can add evidence for us that it truly could be a disease-causing genetic change. Um, sometimes we can also test family members of the patient to understand how that variant has been passed down in the family. Um, and does it seem to only appear in the individuals that have retinal disease? Um, or was it passed down from both parents? And all of that, can we try to put it together to try um, to better interpret the variant result. But ultimately, um, in a lot of cases, we're left to say, we just hope to learn more over time. We can't always clearly answer the question with the first genetic test. Um, so I think just having those kind of, um, you know, Educated expectations going into genetic testing um, is really important when it, when it comes time to discuss the results in the end. Um, it's also important to understand that if we get an inconclusive or a negative genetic test result, um, that doesn't mean that your condition is not genetic. It's tempting to think that, um, but we think that a lot of the reason that we can't find an answer all the time is because we don't know all the genes yet. Um, so as many as we do know, hundreds of genes, we don't think we're finished yet. We haven't discovered all the different genes yet that can cause retinal disorders. So it's possible that your retinal condition is related to a gene that we haven't discovered yet. There are also types of mutations that occur in known genes um, that we're just not able to detect regularly with our current technology. So over time, we expect that our knowledge and our technology will continue to improve. It's already come leaps and bounds in the last even five years, 10 years. So we expect that trend to continue. So if your genetic testing is inconclusive at this point, uh, you may well qualify for genetic testing a few years down the road. Um, that's better at that point in time. Um, also, uh, if you get an inconclu inconclusive or negative genetic test result, it cannot take away the diagnosis of a retinal disorder. So if your retinal specialist has diagnosed you with retinitis pigmentosa, for example, a negative genetic test result can't change that, unfortunately. So, um, you know, those diagnoses really are very much based on your clinical exam and the testing that you've done in clinic, and genetic testing can't take a diagnosis away um, in that way. So overall, um, you know, we've come a long way uh, with our genetic testing and our knowledge, but uh, we have a lot to learn, and I'm the first one to admit that, that we don't know everything there is to know about the genetics of these retinal conditions. Um, but we hope that by adding a lot of this genetic information to registries and databases like My Retina Tracker, um, that will allow us to learn what variants pop up over and over uh, when people go through genetic testing, um, and it tells us which genes we really need to learn a lot more about um, through, the, through registries like that. Um, so happy to take questions um, after Dr. Mansfield, but right now I'd like to turn it over to him. Thank you, Kelsey, and I just wanted to do a little intro because uh, a lot of you hadn't heard earlier, but uh, we'll turn over to the, our final speaker, and then we'll have a 15-minute question and answer, but please welcome Brian Mansfield, who is our Senior Vice President of Research for the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Well, welcome, everyone, to this session on genetics, genetic testing, and the registry, and thank you, Steve, for uh, moderating this. What I'd like to do now is talk to you about registries, what they are, why they're valuable, and then uh, combine that with some of the information you've already heard about genetic testing today. So I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but you know an incredible amount about these diseases that we're trying to find treatments and cures for. You know how it affects you. You know how it's changing over time. You know how quickly it's changing over time. Um, you know what you have to do to cope with the disease as it changes. 
And more importantly, you also know if you had one, one benefit from a treatment or therapy that you would really like to see above all others, you know what that is. Now, this is really important information. In fact, this is incredibly valuable information for researchers who are trying to find treatments and cures for disease. So, you know, you might even know your gene, as you've heard. Many of you have been through genetic testing. I hope many of you will take advantage of the opportunities that we're going to offer to become genetically tested. And that gives us more understanding of your disease. Some of you may have clinical reports, or you could certainly request them from your clinician if you were interested in learning more about the clinical side of the disease. So when you put all this together, you, each individual person in this room, already has an incredible resource about your individual disease. So how do you leverage this information that you have so that we can go out and help people accelerate the discovery of treatments and cures for these retinal diseases? Well, the way you can help, and it costs you nothing, is to join a registry. And this, the registry is very important. When we are approached by companies and researchers who are starting to look at a particular disease or a particular type of disease, one of the first key questions they ask us is, do you have a registry? Do you have a patient registry? And if the answer to that is yes, they immediately want to bore down and understand more about what data you've got in that registry, how much of it is reflecting the patient experience of the disease, how much of it is reflecting the clinical side of the disease, and they always ask, invariably, do they know the gene involved in the disease? So a registry is a very important resource. So let's just think, what is a patient registry? I've really just defined it for you. A registry is a large database, and it's a database that is trying to capture as much information as we can get about a disease so that those who don't know the disease or don't understand the disease or the variability of the disease can quickly get up to speed about it. It also helps us understand the prevalence of disease. We often say that we believe there are 200,000 people in the US affected by an inherited retinal disease. But quite honestly, that's a guess. It's a guess based on data that we've seen out of individual labs, but we really don't know. How many people are there with actually achromatopsia or X-linked RP? Again, we have guesses, but we really don't know. When people like you start to contribute your information to a registry, we actually start to gain real hard data because now we're actually able to start counting people. And when a registry is all-encompassing, when it's not held by a single clinician, but it's in fact covering the whole of the US, or in the case of our registry, the whole of the world, we start to see a very complete picture of how common these diseases are, where they occur, what types of subgroups of disease there are, and how it's affecting people in their lives. So why do we need a registry then? It's, it's a beautiful, it's an incredibly important resource and database to all of us. It's aggregating all of that individual data so that we can look at an ag aggregate of disease of achromatopsia or BIS disease and understand how variable those diseases are. It gives us access to the clinical data, which is a very objective measure of how your best corrected visual acuity or your fundus autograms are changing. Um, and it will give us genetic results down to the actual letter change in your DNA that is causing your disease. It'll help us understand how common the diseases are, how variable their progression is. Um, it will also help us to think about when we come to register for a drug trial, what is the endpoint? What is the measure we're going to use to say this is actually having a consequential, if this drug is having a consequential effect on this person's experience with their disease? That's a very important thing to know. As I've already mentioned, a registry which is complete and has a lot of data in it is a big draw card to pharma. They really like to work with groups who can give them a lot of this information up front in a single point of contact. They don't have to go around talking to every doctor in the country. They can go to one source and get very good data for it. And so that tends to attract researchers and clinicians to it. 
Um, and we'll, I'll go later into how, in fact, companies have been using the database that we've established. But the foundation has realized for a while that there's a very uh, important aspect to having a patient-oriented registry, which is not in the hands of individual clinicians. And so we established an online registry called My Retina Tracker. And I know a number of you have already visited me at the booth just outside the registration desk. And I hope if you have questions later on, you'll come and uh, visit me and ask more questions about it. But my retina tracker starts with the foundation that you as an individual hold a lot of information, but it's also very personal information, and we have to respect your privacy. So the data that you will be asked to put into our registry belongs to you. You can add, modify, and you can delete it. It's yours to do what you want. No one else controls it. And the other founding principle in our registry is that we respect your privacy above everything else. So when we allow researchers to start looking at this beautiful database of information that we've aggregated, they will never be able to find contact information. They'll never be able to find how to reach you by email, phone, mail, regular mail, or anything like that. We actually have put in place a procedure whereby every decision that is made is in your hands individually. So if a company comes to us and says, we found this person, 1154, in the registry, who has some really interesting characteristics, we'd like to get in touch with them. We make sure that they're doing a study which is reasonable and which is well controlled, and it's not a fly-by-night stem cell company or someone like that who we think is gonna put your health at risk. And if we realize that that's true, we'll ask them for a letter which has been approved by a regulatory organization to say it's fair and unbiased in stating their intent in contacting you and why they'd like to speak to you about what they'd like to speak to you about. And if all that passes muster, we then de-identify. So there are only two people in the foundation who actually can see who 5541 in my retina tracker is. It's me and Ms. Joan Fisher, who is our registry coordinator. We alone actually know who you really are. So when we come with this request, with this numbered patient, and it passes our muster, we will take this letter explaining the interest of the researcher or the company, and we will send it to you. And we'll encourage you to read it and talk with your doctor about that possibility that's being offered to you. And then if you're interested, that letter will contain a contact information, how you can reach back to the researcher or the company and say, hey, I'm that person you wanted to know. I'm really interested in working with you. But on the other hand, if you feel, you know, I'm not ready for this particular intervention or I'm not interested in this company, all you do is ignore it. They can't follow you up. They can't bug you. They can't annoy you because at the heart of our registry is your privacy. So how do you join my retina tracker? I know a lot of you are in there already. And in your um, conference bag, you would have been given a trifold, um, which opens out. But on the very back of it, you will find a web address, myretinatracker.org. That's our registry. And it's in your hands to start to join. Your clinician can't do it. It's up to you whether you wish to join or not. If you go to myretinatracker.org and click the Join button, it will then ask you for some information. It'll ask you about your contact information so that I know how to reach out to you. It'll ask you to go through an informed consent process where we will be very transparent about what data we're going to collect, how we're going to use it, who's allowed to look at it, and how we protect your privacy. And after you're comfortable with that informed consent, you will then be led through a series of questions about your disease and how it affects you. Most of these are very simple to answer. They're things you know intuitively. There are drop downs which cover most of the common questions, and you simply fill in the information. So now you've started that off, and the next thing that's available to you is each time you go to your clinician, you can ask them, will you add my clinical data to my registry profile? And again, you don't need to tell the doctor anything other than put it in my retina tracker. What they do is they go to our website, and along the top of the website is a tab that says for clinicians. That's where they go. They need no username, no password. They don't need to know anything about you other than your name, address, and date of birth. 
and we have mechanisms to ensure that the data gets matched up, they can't even see what you've put in the database. That's protected for you alone. And then they can put that clinical information in. And if they say, well, I don't have time or I don't want to, and you'd like that entered, then send it to us. And the email address is on the back of this trifold. It's coordinator at myretinatracker.org, and we'll look after it for you. So the final use of the registry then is we've got your view of the disease, we've got the um, clinical records of the disease, and now the researcher um, can look into that data and, of course, do, as we've talked about, search the data and look for results. So I hope you can see that there's a lot of benefit to the foundation, to companies, to driving research forward by this one act that you can do, which will cost you nothing at all. But as I said, the DNA, the, the gene that affects you, is a really important thing that companies want to know. And we know that insurance doesn't pay for it. We know it's very expensive. It runs into the thousands of dollars. So a very generous donor has given us a grant, which we are starting to use now, uh, we have negotiated rates with a clinical lab so that we can offer um, you a free genetic test combined with free genetic counseling. Now, this is only eligible to people who are in my retina tracker because the point of this test is to enhance the data value of my retina tracker. So you're eligible for it if you are a member of my retina tracker, you are affected by inherited retinal disease, if the clinician is prepared to go into that clinical portal on my retina tracker, put their diagnosis in, and put your best corrected visual acuity in. That's all they have to do. It's very simple. It takes less than five minutes. You need to agree to genetic counseling. As you've heard, the genetic counseling results are very complicated. So we need to have them clearly explained to you so you really understand this is not like a glucose test. You're normal, high or low. These are very complicated. And the counselors do a great job of putting that into terms that you'll understand. And then finally, the clinician has to be willing to order the test. I'm sorry, I can't order it. Because we're using a clinical diagnostic lab, the order has to come from the clinician. So you have to ask the clinician to do this test for you. Now, there are currently about 160, it's growing each day, literally, 160 retinal clinicians who are already ordering the test for participants. Um, if your doctor says, I don't know how to do it, come to me at the um, booth or write to the coordinator of the registry, and we will give you a letter. And this letter is written to the doctor. Send it to the doctor. Don't pay for a visit because they're just going to take it and read it. You don't want to pay for a clinical visit. Send it to them, and it explains to them what this test is all about, how to order it, and how they get the resources they need. And then, when they, if they agree to do that, they will simply fill in the requisite form. They'll get either a saliva test or blood test from you. They'll do the test that you've heard described. And currently, our turnaround time is about 10 to 12 weeks, simply because we've been inundated. Um, over the last 12 months, we've had over 1,600 people wanting testing. So uh, there's a big, big um, demand for it. Uh, and then, the, then when the result is ready, it will be given back to you by the clinician or the genetic counselor. Uh, and it will also be entered into your MyRetina Tracker uh, profile for you. So uh, you don't even have to worry about doing that. So let me stop at, at that stage, and uh, we'll open up the discussion to questions. But if you have any questions about MyRetina Tracker and genetic testing in particular, then please do visit me at the booth opposite the registration desk, and we can talk one-on-one -on -one more. Thank you. Thank, thank you, doctors. We are going to have 15 minutes of question and answer. Um, please, we have uh, some mic runners in the audience. Please wait until they get, uh, please raise your hand and let them get to you. And please limit to one question. We want to make sure we get as many questions answered. And the, the speakers will be available throughout the session afterward anyway. So uh, first question. Okay, um, I believe I am in retinal tracker. Um, recently, uh, my brother, who also has RP, uh, he determined that 
rather than the uh, double recessive, we do have X-linked RP, uh, the uh, GR exon variant 10. So that was fairly recent that we learned that within the last year. Um, almost definitely, I, I would have the same thing as my brother because um, we presented about the same. But I guess my question is, is um, what would you suggest if I wanted to, I guess, first find out if I am in the, the database and, and how I would go about um, if I should personally be retested if my brother had the same presentation? Just any kind of moving forward from here, because my ultimate objective, like many, is to have to try to qualify for one of the clinical trials. Thank you. Is my mic on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I agree with you um, that you, I would be very surprised if you had a different uh, genetic cause for your RP compared to your brother. And, um, you know, if it's that RPGR gene, there are some clinical trials gearing up for that gene, so it would be really useful uh, to confirm that. Um, so there's a couple different ways that that can go. You could sign up through the My Retina Tracker program, um, pursue genetic testing. Most likely, if they know that you have a family member with a positive result, they'll zoom in on that one gene. There's no need to test the rest of the genes. Uh, they'll zoom in on that one gene to confirm that you have the same exact mutation that runs in the family. Um, but if you did the whole gene panel, we'd expect you to have the same result as well. Um, and I do want to be clear that, you know, this is an amazing program that the testing is uh, paid for by the foundation, but there are also ways, um, you know, where insurance sometimes pays for testing or some people are interested in paying out of pocket, and those are options as well. Um, but if there's already an identified mutation in the family, uh, it's definitely most efficient to just go after that one specific mutation to get a yes or no answer. I would just add that be sure to tell your clinician if they don't know that it runs in the family. Mm -hmm. um, you really don't want to go through a full panel test if, in fact, they only need to test that one gene because there's about a five-fold difference in cost. And so it's more cost efficient for the foundation if we know it's in the family to test for that one first. Uh, Steve? Steve? We, we have a question here. Um, if you guys have questions, can you raise your hands uh, and we'll get them lined up so that the mics are at the speakers so we can get going here. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you were saying that the test results uh, can be difficult to decipher and that you should go to a genetic counselor. Is it advised to get a second or a third opinion as well on that? No, I think that the, uh, when you're dealing with the groups that we do and the clinicians we do and the genetic counselors we do, they all give a very consistent um, quality of, of result and you're in good hands with any of the people that you choose but um, you will find that it is not a simple result they will simplify it for you but as you heard before sometimes you end up with variants of uncertain significance or you have a recessive disease where you expect to find two mutations and you only find one and you're not sure is that the cause of your disease or is there another one that hasn't been found somewhere else um, but I think that you're in good hands at the moment with the quality of, of counseling that goes on. But. Next question, Lori. Uh, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> oh, hey. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to follow up quickly on that point with regard to um, sometimes the, the results can be complicated, but this is a place in which clinical laboratories partner very well with research laboratories. If we need to go deeper to understand those variants of unclear significance, the research laboratories, such as ours, have developed cell-based or indeed animal-based models to try to understand what's happening. Um, and we can help inform that for, for future um, testing results. Uh, two quick questions. So in the the information about like why to seek genetic testing, I, I don't think I heard anything about to understand prognosis. Um, and since that is one of the big questions that sort of hangs over people's heads, um, if you could give any feedback on that of just, is there anything about genetic testing that's helping with prognosis? Um, and then the second question about my retina tracker, which is awesome, thank you guys for doing that, is if you can just give a sense of how international that effort is, and also is there anything that we can do as sort of patient advocates to, to help to grow that resource? Sure. So I think I can speak a little bit to the prognosis question. Um, 
And I'm glad you asked uh, because the answer to that is sort of yes and no, whether a genetic test result can allow us to give you a good prognosis. Um, it can sometimes give us a general guideline. Um, you know, certain genes tend to cause earlier onset or uh, more severe retinal disease or faster progression than others. Um, but it's not a crystal ball. As much as we wish it could be, a genetic test result cannot tell us exactly when you could reach the point of legal blindness, for example. Um, it can't tell us really how quickly things progress. And we do know that with certain genes, like the ABCA4 gene in Stargardt, for example, um, even though we're talking about the exact same gene, there is a huge um, variety of symptoms that people experience. Some people are diagnosed early, some later, um, and we're not yet able to understand all of the factors that play into that, although that is part of an area of active research to understand if there are any gene mutations that would allow us to predict um, what your vision loss could be going forward. Does that answer your question? Okay. And to address your question about how international, so my retina tracker is a web-based um, database, so anyone anywhere in the world who has access to the internet can actually join my retina tracker. Um, importantly, the site is currently in English, and the informed consent, which is really a key document um, stating what we do with your data, how we protect your privacy, is in English also. We do have Google Translate on that page, and so uh, for people who speak uh, a different language, they could use Google Translate. I know sometimes it can be a little hilarious in the way it interprets. Um, and by and far, what I've heard from people, we have about 200 people out of 8,000 in the registry at the moment who are um, overseas. Um, what we found with them is they say, we'll laugh our way through Google Translate, but what we really want professionally translated is the informed consent to understand what we're getting into. So we will expand it at some stage, but our initial target is to expand it through the um, US and English speaking world. But please tell everyone you know who's affected by the disease that um, this is a great resource to join. And um, the other thing I didn't uh, remember to say was that if you have family members who are affected, they can join my retina tracker and when they do, there's a point in the question where they can ask for a family code, which is a way that we can link family members in the database together. And that is very useful um, for our researchers uh, in some of the work they do. Olivia, you have a question back there on the right. Yes, um, I am a patient of a specialist at Kellogg Eye Center in Ann Arbor. Uh, however, I live on the West Coast, so it's a bit of a, a haul, and because of an autoimmune component to my disease, I'm researching some other options on the West Coast, but still retaining that other specialist. Can more than one clinician contribute? I'm already registered through Kellogg last month. They did the genetic testing, so I'm waiting for my results, but if I do add another clinician, say, on the West Coast, can they both contribute that information? Uh, that's a good question, and yes, absolutely they can. The only time I'm worried about multiple clinicians is if two of them try to order the test at the same time. Um, we only want one clinician ordering the genetic test, but as you say, in your case, you've already had that done. And of course, what we, we like you to augment your profile with any clinical records that you have, um, no matter who the source is. Thank you, Amy. Go ahead. Um, in regards to um, Bardet Biedel or syndrome, I've been told I have those characteristics. Is it best to go through my retina tracker to get that tested for? I think that's really a, a great option given that uh, it's at no cost to you for the moment and you will be uh, entered into this registry that will allow the tracking of your, the progression of your condition and eventually we can match that up with, with a genetic finding. So I, I think that's a, a great idea. Okay. All right, we have time for just a couple other questions. Lori? Hi. Um, uh, my husband was recently tested, uh, genetically tested. We knew he had Usher's syndrome, but we didn't know which type. And when the results came back, um, they, the genetic counselor explained they had never 
seen this exact mutation before. And um, so they had his parents both tested, which confirmed it. But um, when they said they had never seen it before, they also said that he had type 1D. And I'm wondering, how did they know he had 1D if they had never seen this before? And then the second part, my second question is about the, the tracker, my retinal tracker. My husband was born in Ireland, and we're wondering how we can kind of connect with other people with the same gene uh, defect, in because it, since it seems to be rare, it's probably more common in Ireland since he comes from there. So um, just those two questions. <laughs> Uh, well, without knowing the exact results, my guess from the information that you provided is perhaps that um, the gene that he carries is a known gene to cause Usher syndrome, specifically type 1D, but perhaps the exact DNA misspelling within that gene is novel or brand new. Um, that happens pretty frequently, actually, that there will be no one else in our databases that's ever had that type of mutation, um, and depending on um, you know, there's some computer models that the labs use to try to predict the effect of that mutation. We try to match it up with symptoms. Um, but sometimes that's why a, a variant is an, of uncertain significance, because we've never seen it in anyone before. Um, but we can, in some cases, make educated guesses um, and connections based on symptoms or how that change um, affects the gene function. So that would be my best guess is to explain that. In terms of your question of connecting to others, um, I really understand that question because with the orphan diseases and when we start fragmenting them by genes and then by mutations, we do come down to some conditions where there are very few people around and it's very hard to find them. We currently do not support that sort of function in my retina tracker because it creates a problem with privacy issues and it also creates a problem of being sure that we can moderate any discussions that go on, which requires another resource that we don't have built in there at the moment. So while we're aware of it and we discuss it, we don't have any built-in ability for one member of my retina tracker to connect with another member of my retina tracker. Um, but there are a lot of bulletin boards around which do have, in social media, which are very active. And if you start raising those sort of questions on those bulletin boards, I think you might be surprised how quickly you can get a, a response. Okay, we have just two more questions, and then we'll have to cut the, um, the questioning, but there'll be time available later. Yeah, right here. Thank in front. you. Uh, if, if I had some genetic testing made five years ago for RP, there was no, no conclusion. They didn't know the gene. If, if I have a new test made five years after, is that a better test, or is it just the same, the same technique? It's just waiting for the gene to be discovered, and... If it's discovered, uh, is, it, is the laboratory uh, following through, or you have to be, you know, like calling up every six months or whatever and, and make sure they follow up? Yeah, so um, the question is if, you know, your last genetic test was done five years ago but was inconclusive at that time. Um, and that's a great question because um, our knowledge has come a long way even in five years. Um, so maybe five years ago for RP, we were ordering a test with less than 100 genes, and now we're over 200. Um, so that's huge leaps and bounds that we've made. Um, so in that case, it may be worthwhile to pursue new genetic testing because I would expect it to be better um, in that it, it looks at more genes than were probably looked at five years ago. Um, but any test report that you get should list which genes were analyzed as part of that test. So that's worth reviewing with your clinician to see if our gene list now is better than the gene list that was available to you five years ago. We, we often get that, and the question is, what is the cutoff? Is it one year, two years, five years, mm -hmm. 10 years? And part of it is that the technology has changed over the last few years. So following on from the point that Kelsey made, um, at one stage, people didn't run a full panel test, so they didn't look for all known genes at the time. They would try to guess what sort of RP or, or uh, uh, inherited retinal disease you had, and then just test for a small group of genes which were the most likely candidates. 
With the technology moving now, where sequencing has become much cheaper, much faster, much more comprehensive, it's much easier for us to just take all known genes that cause inherited retinal diseases and sequence them in one go. So going back five and a little further years ago, they, we may even have known your gene, but if you were put through this staggered testing program and they didn't find anything on the first round and you were never taken to the second round, you, you may not have known your gene anyway, even though it may be one that they knew of. So one of the advantages of the current tests now that we run are the full panel tests where everything is tested. But I think to Kelsey's point, if you look at the original report, it will tell you how many genes were tested, and we will quickly, a, a good genetic counselor will quickly know uh, how to guide you on those sort of decisions. All right, with respect to our agenda, I apologize, we'll have to cut the question short. I want to make sure we get, our next sessions are coming right up here. I want to make sure everybody can get there on time. So please thank our doctors here for this presentation. And, as, and thank you for coming out here. As you all know, the doctors at the conference are available at any other time. So please uh, ask your questions afterward. And thank you for joining us this afternoon.